All right, it is 12 o'clock, and I am going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, uh, to the second installment of the Forestry Lunch Break series on hardwoods. Uh, I'm Patrick Schultz, uh, Extension Forester with Washington State University. Um, so before we get started, I just want to remind everyone um, in the meantime, or sorry, I was <laughs> just reading off the slides, uh, to, to set your chat box to setting to everyone so everybody can get uh, see your questions as you put them in the chat box. And you are, of course, welcome to put those questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. And a reminder, too, that this is recorded, and I will be sending out those recordings early next week, along with I'm keeping a list of um, publications and resources that we've mentioned. So I'll try to send those out just kind of in batch, um, maybe next Monday or Tuesday. So look forward to that. If you did miss a session, I got several emails from people that, um, for whatever reason, couldn't attend. So with that, we are going to, and I see someone mentioned that they can see the transcript. Yes, I've enabled auto caption. I forgot to do that yesterday and I apologize to anybody that relies on auto caption, um, but I wanted to make sure I enabled that today. So today we are talking about big leaf maple. This is one of my personal favorites. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's my absolute favorite hardwood tree. I think that's uh, Oregon oak. And we'll talk about that on Thursday. But this is certainly one of the, uh, call it in the top five, <laughs> for sure. I love big leaf maple. It's a very cool species, um, something that has a lot of value to humans and forests. And we'll be talking about why over the next 20 minutes or so. So the basics, uh, the scientific name is Acer macrophyllum, which literally, just like yesterday with Alanis rubra, means red alder. Acer macrophyllum literally means uh, big leaf maple. Ma macrophyllum means big leaf. Acer is the maple family. Um, and so this genus is in the Sapindaceae family. So all maples are in the Acer family, and they're all in Sapindaceae. Um, the height of maples, let's just get into the size, it ranges quite a bit, but it could be 50 to 65 feet tall, with the tallest being 88 feet. That's the tallest known. Um, two and a half, two to five feet in diameter at maturity, which is pretty impressive. Um, and the largest being 97 inches, again, largest known, uh, which is, if you do the math, that's about eight feet in diameter. It's pretty big. So the crowns are impressive in big leaf maple. They often spread uh, 50 plus feet from one side to the other. And the largest known there is 104 feet. So, you know, that's a third of a football field right there. It's a pretty impressive species. It's longer lived than red alder, uh, which we discussed yesterday. It's uh, approximate sort of age of decline is about 200 years, although certainly there are trees that are uh, older than that, you know, going beyond 300 years. I couldn't find the oldest known big leaf maple. Maybe someone else was able to find it. Um, but around 200 years, I think, is when they start to decline, become a little more susceptible to pests and disease, and, um, and at that point kind of fade out. So some notable features about big leaf maple produces it produces edible flowers and sap. Uh, I'll talk about both. Um, and it's a known supporter of many epiphytes. I'll also talk about this in more detail, but uh, it's it's known to be able to host a, a mature tree up to one ton in weight of epiphytes, which is really cool. And it's the largest maple species in North America, along with the largest leaves. Speaking of leaves, um, most people, even those that aren't super familiar with um, the, uh, you know, native species, forestry, tree identification, that kind of thing, can probably pick out a big leaf maple because of its classic maple shape. Uh, it has those three to five toothed lobes. You can see here, one, two, three, four, five. Those are the lobes on the leaf. Kind of that palm looking maple leaf that we all know and love. They're obviously very large, eight to 12 inches across. I have seen them bigger than 12 inches for sure. Um, very dark green on top, pale underneath. Um, and if you take, uh, if you're during the growing season, at least, uh, if you take a, a, a leaf off and you break the petiole, which is the stem of the leaf, you'll often see this sort of milky sap inside. And it's a good way to differentiate it from other maples if you're struggling. Um, 
for whatever reason, it has a very milky sap. And the only other maple I believe that does that is the Norway maple, which is uh, ornamental. And it turns this beautiful golden yellow in the fall and it adds a really nice color to the landscape here. So the leaf and twig arrangement, this is the really one of the best ways to identify it is opposite. So yesterday, we remember we had red alder, which is alternating up the stem. Um, these, the leaves and the branching is all going to be opposite of each other on the stem. The bark is not easy to identify on its own. Gray, green, smooth when young, and then it turns brown, furrowed, like what you see here behind the maple flowers. Uh, and again, can be completely covered in epiphytes. So you might not even be seeing the bark. Um, and then it has these really noticeable flowers in the spring. Um, the male and female flowers are both inside of these long, droopy clusters. And eventually they develop into the um, samaras, the, the helicopter seeds uh, that we all played with as kids. So in terms of range, it's uh, kind of similar to red alder, except it doesn't extend as far north. It can't handle the cold, so it won't get all the way up into Alaska. Um, but it does extend a little further south. So in the north, it's inhibited by too much cold temperatures. In the south, it's inhibited by uh, too, too, um, too much drought, not enough moisture, basically. Uh, but really, Oregon, Washington, southern BC, this is where big leaf maple really thrives. Uh, and it tends to grow kind of, again, too similar, similar to red alder on sites that are, are a little bit better drained, but lots and lots of moisture. That's where it really likes to grow, although you can find it on a wide variety of sites. So floodplains, stream banks, drainage slopes, those tend to be preferred, and then below 3,000 feet elevation in Washington. So let's get into the silvics, which uh, is just a term for like the characteristic, the traits of, of a species. Uh, it produces seed at roughly 10 years old, and it is monaceous, uh, similar to red alder yesterday. It has separate male and female flowers, but they're on the same tree. So there's the, the possibility of, of self-pollinating, uh, although it is usually, I believe, cross-pollinated. Um, and it's very hard to pick out. And in fact, I really couldn't get a good idea of where the male flowers were in this. I think these are actually the starts of young Samaras here, uh, which is kind of cool. But they flower, these, these beautiful flowers, they come out in early spring. And they're really important pollinator species or pollinator um, food for that reason, because they come in the spring when really nothing else is blooming. So they can be very important for pollinators. And the flowers are edible. Uh, it's really common for people to make maple fritters. These are some that I made last year. They're delicious, although most things are when you deep fry them. Um, and then I also tried pickling them, which is a little bit of white vinegar and garlic and dill. They're, they're delicious. So you want to get those flowers when they're young and tender. Uh, you don't want to wait too long. Otherwise, they become kind of bitter and dry and chewy. So uh, I've learned that from experience. You want to get them while they're young. So it is a prolific seed producer. Um, and I don't know if this is maybe a heavy mass year around where I'm at, but I, I feel like the maples this year really produced a lot of seed. Um, and as I mentioned, there, it's those helicopter seeds, right? But the difference here from maybe some of the other maples we know is that they're, they're very hairy, right? They're kind of ugly looking, if you ask me. But um, they uh there there's a lot produced in a single year but the seed really only is viable for about a year germination goes from about 85 percent in the first year to like maybe 10 or 15 percent in the second year so if you're thinking of starting from seed it's important not to let that seed sit for too long it's also a prolific stump sprouter and i think a lot of small forest owners uh listening in uh for many of you the maple you have may may have uh, regenerated through stump sprouts or what we call vegetative uh, sprouting. So it's very common post harvest or fire. And given the last, you know, century plus of harvesting, um, the the coppicing or, or sorry, the, re the stump sprouting was pretty prolific in that period, wherever you took maple off, that maple was going to sprout back. And if you didn't control it uh, with herbicide, then you're going to end up with a stand like this. This is a stand um, that I helped manage for WSU. And it was harvested in the 90s. They did come back and they planted dug fir, but almost none of it survived in the interior of the forest. There's some left on the very edge of the forest where it could get sunlight, 
but in the interior the maple won out so did the alder um so it's just that fast juvenile growth really outcompetes the conifers especially when it's it's working on a pre-existing root system so it just has all the advantages so if you're trying to grow conifers conifer plantation um you do need to control your your um your big leaf maple sprouts if if you took maple off the site to begin with and then that's best done by cutting them and then applying an herbicide to the cut stump like uh triclopyr which is garlon or even a, a glyphosate product so if you're willing though and and part of the reason we're talking about this today is to sort of encourage people to to maybe not necessarily go out and plant hardwoods although i certainly encourage that but at least allow some of them to survive because of their benefits on your property um you can take these coppices or these clumps as i like to call them and manage them uh for sort of long-term vigor and it's really the same concept as thinning you get in there and you select three to five of the best stems uh and you remove the rest and this allows the tree to continue to to allocate resources to those stems that you leave behind without triggering its um, stump sprout response and there wouldn't be any herbicide necessary in this but if you don't do it you'll get clusters like this with lots of small stems and they're actually competing inside of the same tree for for resources particularly sunlight so it is important to go in and thin these out so it is moderately shade tolerant, um, but it prefers at least small gaps in the canopy if it's actually going to regenerate and recruit uh, in an understory. So it's really, it's not going to grow like maybe cedar or hemlock does in an understory where we'll actually put on some height growth each year. In fact, it's really known to be a seedling banker um, where it just kind of stays as a seedling and waits until the canopy opens up over top and then it starts to actually grow and it will grow relatively fast at that point from what I understand. But the the thing is too, it's a preferred browse species. So that's one of the reasons you don't really see a lot of maple seedlings on the forest floor, especially if you have high deer or elk populations. And these days there's a lot of especially deer, black deer, tailed deer populations. So the widespread canopy can take up significant growing spaces. We talked about the largest ever was 104 feet across. Um, and again, in the context of a traditional conifer plantation, you know, that could take up several, you know, maybe 10 viable, uh, the space for 10 viable dug firs. Uh, so, you know, for hardcore tree farmers, maple is a little bit maligned for that reason. But if you're not really interested in timber production, um, that widespread and canopy can create some really interesting micro sites, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So the long life, though, and ability to, to regenerate and moderate shade makes it a really important part of old growth for us. If you've ever been to the hoe, uh, rainforest or uh, out to the Grove of the Patriarchs in the Mount Rainier area or anywhere where there's some old growth, you're probably going to see a pretty strong big leaf maple component. So I want to talk about damage and disease in big leaf maples. Unfortunately, there are a number of things that are affecting maples right now. One of them is sooty bark disease, which is caused by the fungus Cryptostroma corticale, cortical. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, it's uh, called sooty bark because it creates these black mats of fungal spores that look a lot like soot. Um, and it's affecting all, all kinds of maples in the Acer, anything in the Acer family, including ornamentals, uh, as well as our native big leaf maple. So this was actually not a new thing. It was discovered in Washington in 1968 and was just never particularly aggressive, never really much of a problem. Um, but recent outbreaks have been linked to the severe droughts and the hot summers that we're having um, has been a problem with a number of different species. But this is that sort of accelerated some problems with sooty bark disease and we're starting to see more of it for that reason but it does typically it was restricted to stressed and weakened trees though for that reason um, and if your trees are healthy they have the resources they need they should be able to defend themselves from this but also one reason that you see it a little more in stressful places like trees or like roadsides and um, you know maybe parks and landscapes things like that one important note the spores can cause respiratory irritation it's actually recommended if you have this issue and you're going to be working with that wood to, to wear a mask and glasses just to kind of protect yourself certainly not gonna gonna cause you serious harm uh in the first 
you know, contact or anything unless you're a sensitive person to that. But it's important to keep that in mind and long term exposure can cause some issues. So this is a really great website here in general, forcehealth.org. I encourage everyone to check that out. This is started by uh, Joey Holbert in the Puyallup Extension Center. Uh, but he's got a landing page on city bark disease that has lots of information on this. Big leaf maple decline is another one. Um, and anytime you hear the term decline, uh, species followed by decline, just know that that's a, a forestry term for we're really not sure what's killing it, but we, we are recognizing a general decline in this species for whatever reason. And this has been observed since 2010, maybe even a little earlier. And some of the symptoms are listed here. This is a pretty good example of what you would see, sort of smaller leaves, not certainly getting to that 8 to 12 inches uh, size, chlorotic, very yellowish, maybe even some signs of scorch in the leaves, crown thinning, branch dieback, all, you, all of which you can see here, sometimes a heavy seed crop too, not corp crop. Um, and so really what they've they've studied this for a period and they've really tied it to uh, drought and heat again and being in stressful environments like forest edges, urban areas, landscapes, roads. So there's not a single pest or disease responsible. It just sort of makes them susceptible to other species like or to other pests like uh, root rot or maybe sooty bark or maybe I think there was a leaf hopper that was identified at one point. Um, but the, the general decline occurs primarily through that drought and heat and big leaf maple can be very sensitive to that. So there are a bunch of others as well. Uh, powdery mildew is something people deal with, dealt with a lot this year because we had a really cool wet spring, which is good for the fungus. Um, this is not really going to affect your tree's health long term, provided we don't get three or four years of, of bad mildew issues. Um, it's really the trees will bounce back just fine. Same goes for the speckled tar spot. This is really just an aesthetic thing. It doesn't really affect the health of the tree. And honestly, the, a lot of trees get this every year and they're, they're completely fine. Our malaria is um, a root rot that uh, can affect big leaf maple. Um, and it's... Uh, I actually have some of that on the property I manage as well. It's not terribly common, but it does happen. And then in terms of invasives, we are keeping an eye out on this thing called the Asian longhorn beetle, which uh, does go after maple. So we don't have it in Washington yet, and we want to keep it that way. Um, but regardless, the management here is maintaining tree vigor, managing your stand density, keeping your trees healthy, getting them light water, nutrients, and space that they need, and then good site selection, making sure when you're planting, you're picking a spot where your trees are going to be happy. Um, and yeah, just because I didn't do this yesterday when I mentioned the banded alder borer, uh, it looks a lot like Asian longhorn beetle. I've gotten a lot of... Uh, uh emails about this before people haven't caught a banded all the more and thinking it might be alb so you can see the why they would be confused they do look similar but when you start to look at the patterns there they're actually quite different and remember banded alder borer is just a, a detrivore it just eats on feeds on dead wood totally native it's a good friend of ours the asian longhorn beetle not so much we don't want that one so ecological role and importance, um, it typically grows in mixed stands, but it can definitely be a dominant canopy species in certain areas. Um, and it has, a, it, as I said, it has a wide range of places it can grow, but there are certainly areas where it wants to grow a little more. You will see it on relatively dry sites grow to a full tree size, and it might not live its full 200 years there, but it will be there and be a part of the canopy. So it's often a, a component of mixed stands, but again, and it can it can be very dominant in some areas. These are some of the associated species. Really, the list is longer than this, um, but I didn't. Uh, uh, these are some some of the big players, I guess. And as you said, it can be present at any seral stage. It can be present right at the beginning of a, a forest life when, uh, with you know, vegetative sprouting. Uh, from old stumps, but it's typically getting uh, uh, entering um, a forest as a major component at a mid to late successional stage, um, historically speaking, at least. And it is an important riparian species, similar to alder. It reduces soil and stream bank erosion. It adds uh, shade, woody debris, and nutrient inputs to riparian habitats. So, I'll actually, talk about that a little more in a slide or two. Um, so importance to wildlife. This is an important wildlife species. As we said, it's the favored browse species for deer and elk, whether we like it or not. 
Um, the beaver feed on bark and use stems for dams and lodges. My experience uh, is that maple is kind of a preferred species in this regard, but maybe that may just be me. Um, birds and rodents will feed on maple seeds. Uh, there's good nesting and cavity habitat. In fact, in British Columbia, they found that uh, old big leaf maple trees were really the preferred cavity tree for pileated woodpeckers. Uh, and as we mentioned, it's a very important pollinator species because of that early spring bloom. Um, and let's talk about foliage. We, we talked about it a little bit, but like alder, but actually more so even than alder, um, big leaf maple really drops a lot of foliage on the ground each year and really co it contributes to soil in that regard. Um, but because of its widespreading crown and all the foliage that it drops annually, a big leaf maple creates these really great microsites underneath its canopy. So the soils below maple, maples have been shown to have higher cation, cation exchange capacity, which if you're not familiar, that's just the, the ability of the soil to hold on to uh, and make available nutrients for plant growth. Um, and it has higher concentrations of carbon, calcium, potassium, magnesium, and nitrates. Some of those studies differ in that a little bit, but carbon and nitrate for sure have always pretty much been proven to be higher in those microsites. Um, large amounts of the sort of just detritus in general, including foliage and down branches from big leaf maple have also been tied to increased macroinvertebrate habitat in riparian areas, which we know is good for fish habitat. Um, and then even just in upland areas, that dense leaf litter layer really provides good habitat for for insects and, and microfauna. So um, that it obviously those canopies get really big, but they really do a lot for the soil below it. And as you said, it's absolutely heaven for these epiphytes, and it's a really unique trait of big leaf maple. Um, certainly, there are epiphytes on other trees, but not quite at the scale. Uh, and it's likely connected to the moisture retention of big leaf maple bark, which it makes it available uh, to these epiphytes. And remember, epiphytes are not parasites. They don't steal nutrients from the tree. They're just using that tree or, or plant for support and then sort of collecting nutrients and moisture from the space around it and the air and, and things like that. So these are just some common species here, although it's not an exhaustive list by any means. And the kind of species hosted will vary a lot depending on the location in the tree uh, and just little micro environments. And they've done a lot of studies into this that are really interesting, including some that have shown that the kinds of epiphytes you'll find on a maple could be indicators of good or bad air quality, whether there's certain heavy metals in the air, um, might in influence the uh, species composition of epicytes, of epiphytes, sorry. So yeah, the dense epiphyte communities uh, can serve as rooting medium for plants and a food source for arthropods. Um, and sometimes they're even harvested for sort of botanical products, which is pretty cool. So in terms of indigenous people's use of big leaf maple, there was quite a few. Uh, bark could be used for rope. The wood was used for a number of things, but the most popular was canoe paddles. Uh, and in fact, it was called the paddle tree and still is called the paddle tree among some tribes. So leaves were used to wrap food and other items. The barks uh, could be used to uh, treat sore throats. Um, shoes could be used for basket weaving, fuel wood. What I was thinking was interesting is that there's little or no evidence of sap collection in this area, even though big leaf maple uh, does produce a sweet sap. Um, but, but, you know, in the eastern part of the country, there's lots of history of indigenous peoples using the sap. Um, so I, I feel like it probably did happen. Maybe we just don't have a good record of it. Um, and the, there is some evidence that maples were actually managed and burned or pruned to force that sprouting to use maybe for shoots for basket weaving or fuel wood or, or whatever. Today, there's a number of products that come from it, although maple as a whole is generally considered to be a pretty low value wood. Um, it uh, is easily machined and it has good, good uses, good grain. It's not suitable for outdoor uses, which is important. Um, but, you know, there's potential veneer products, furniture, paneling, flooring, plywood, musical instruments, all these things. But it's generally just because of the market, it's, it's considered it's always pretty low value uh, relative to even alder um, as a hardwood. So figured maple, though, is the exception. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with this, but figured maple is a tree, uh, a maple tree with a very unique grain pattern inside. 
And it's extremely high value. It's not uncommon to get a few thousand dollars out of a single tree. And that's even just a small amount of wood from that tree. Um, and it's used for furniture and musical instruments, um, anything that's that sort of highlights this really beautiful pattern. It's really not a lot known that about what causes this pattern. Uh, there's some efforts to look into that and maybe even propagate it, but it's this really interesting thing. And you can just see how, how beautiful that pattern is. So moving along, just talking about agroforestry opportunities here. Um, some of you may know there's some efforts right now to sort of establish a, a big leaf maple syrup industry in Washington because it does produce a sweet sap that can be processed into syrup and other sugar products. Uh, so UW, OSU, w, and us at WSU, we've been participating in some research and outreach efforts. And anybody that's interested in trying this out, I really encourage you to join our citizen science program called Sap Suckers. This is a great opportunity to contribute some of your, your data if you're collecting sap on your property uh, to this program so we can kind of figure out what causes better or worse sap flow and sap quality, those kind of things. And of course, because it does create relatively light shade, not as light as alder, it creates other opportunities to grow forest crops if this is something that interests you in the uh, understory. So I want to talk about management, but I have to point out that the managing for big leaf maple is, is very uncommon. Uh, and, and I don't know anyone that has a uh, a purposeful big leaf maple plantation, something they planted intended the way that you would do, you know, dug fir or something like that. Um, that it's not even very common with alder, but there are example examples of that out there with maple. I'm not, I'm not really sure there are, um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't because big leaf maple, as we've discussed, is uh, it's very valuable ecologically. Um, so when it comes to site selection, as we mentioned, it can grow in a wide variety of sites, but it really wants those deep, well-drained soils with abundant moisture. So river terraces, floodplains, seepage areas. It really doesn't like to have its feet soaking, though. It can handle a little bit of that, but it doesn't want to be in a spot where it's going to be you know, seasonally flooded for long periods of time. In terms of site preparation, if you're working with vegetative reproduction, that stump sprouting, you really, you really don't need any. You know, that's probably going to get over top of whatever foliage grows really quickly. But control would obviously be needed if you're planting. Um, uh, oh, sorry, if you're if you're going to be planting seedlings. Uh, speaking of seedlings, they can be kind of difficult to come by just because, again, maple is not a very popular species to be managing for, but it's relatively easy to propagate from seed. Uh, you can collect and plant it in the fall, and keeping it in sort of partial shade is good because those seedlings can be very sensitive to heat, um, and if especially if we have another hot summer. The, the recommended density for planting would probably be in the 10 to 12 foot spacing. This is again, if you were to go out and plant a, a plantation, it's not as quite as dense as red alder maybe, but it still requires some level of density to keep that, that upward growth going. Um, and you can also underplant it in, in existing can canopies. As I mentioned, it, it can get established in light shade, but it really does need some small gaps to sort of create that rapid growth and recruit it into the overstory. So if that's something you're going to do, and that probably is the more likely scenario, you should really consider opening up the gaps, uh, the canopy just a little bit to allow that, that tree to have some space to grow and, and the light it needs to really recruit. And then browse protection is really key because uh, deer really love maple. So I'm going to really speed through this to leave time for questions because it's just, again, it's just so uncommon to manage maple as like a real plantation. But remember that thinning is really important. It's similar to alder. You know, you want to hit your thinning windows when they're young and vigorously growing. Both of these trees have young, vigorous juvenile growth. So you're either going to be managing your stump sprouts or your stems per acre if you're planting by seedlings um, in a pre-commercial thin from, you know, five to 15 years. And then if you're really intensively managing it, you could probably get a saw log harvest in 40 to 50 years. So again, very uncommon to do this. More than likely, you're going to be working with mixed stands or maybe uh, sort of working with a, a plantation, a conifer plantation and, and applying something like variable density thinning or, or some other method to open the canopy up and sort of work in a hardwood influence. So that, that's a much more common scenario. So it is 12.30. I want to get to the questions now. If people are willing to hang out a little longer, I am absolutely happy to stay and work through these questions. But remember, um, this is all recorded. So I'll work through the, the questions regardless. And if you have to hop off, you can always come back and view the recording.
All right. So looking back through the chat box, let me make it a little bigger here. Um, does applying the herbicide kill the whole tree or just the unwanted stems? If you are sort of thinning out an individual clump uh, of, of, of a big leaf maple with you know a multi-stemmed tree you really don't need to use herbicide and i wouldn't recommend it uh if you're just trying to go from a tree with 20 stems down to like three to five stems you're just going to be removing the excess stems and and not applying any herbicide that really won't be necessary um so but if you are trying to kill the tree absolutely then you know if you're trying to to avoid getting that stump sprout situation then you would that's when you would want to apply a cut stump like a garlon or a glyphosate or something like that are the spores from sooty bark disease a hazard for people with asthma if they're just hanging out near the trees rather than actively cutting or working with the wood i can't say with any confidence on that angela um suffice to say that we know that obviously they they do spread via spores so depending on your proximity to the tree i imagine as you get closer the spore count would be a little bit higher but certainly it's going to be the the worst when you're actually working with the wood cutting it down and that kind of thing i don't think if you're you know five to ten feet away from the tree that you're really going to be impacted by it unless you're really hanging out there a long time but that that's just conjecture i can't really say for sure um, so Kevin says, with respect to planted seedling, seedling, sorry, the hardwood silviculture co-op at OSU has real problems with elk browse and research studies. Also, there was some discussion of planting check, little above ground growth for the first or more growing season, and it was never never followed up on. Maybe just establishing a root system after planting. Yeah. So as it and and he po points out a very great resource, the Hardwood Silviculture Co-op um, at OSU is a really great resource on all things hardwoods, really, um, but especially maple and alder. And yeah, I mean that points out the the fact that I, I don't know if they're growing it in an understory. Um, but there's not going to be much above ground growth if there's significant shade over top. And I'm not sure if that's what you're alluding to, but they are trying to build a root system after planting and they can continue to get browsed and come back if there's adequate light. That's that I've seen that. Um, but if it happens repeatedly year after year, eventually that tree is, is not going to survive. Uh, Curtis asks, do they handle an inundation well? Uh, and the answer is no, not really. They can handle a little bit of seasonal flooding, but they really don't like to have their feet soaked like an Oregon ash does, which we'll talk about tomorrow. I actually can't remember if we're talking about ochre or ash tomorrow. I have to look at the schedule. Um, Davis, Dave, oh, hey, Dave, Dave Peterson says big leaf maples can have adventitious roots in the canopy branches produce roots that grow into the epiphyte layer on the branch, giving the tree access to water and nutrients. That is really cool. Um, I've seen quite a few upper branches and trunks, two to four inches in diameter with dollar bill size bark removed and subsequent dieback cause, um, hard to say without seeing a picture but that it's possible that could be something like sooty bark disease. What it tends to do, those places where those black mats form, they kind of press out from under the bark. And I, when I've seen it, I have seen patches of the bark being completely fall off. And then underneath, you see all that sooty bark underneath. So that, that is possible. Um, but again, without seeing pictures, um, I can't, can't say with any confidence. So, as I said yesterday, I would recommend that anyone that's experiencing some sort of forest health issue like this and isn't certain, a site visit is always the best way to go. And so I want to point people towards the DNR service forestry program, uh, call your local service forester, have them come out to your property and help help you get something identified on the ground. That really is the only way to, to say with confidence. How would epiphytes appear if there are air pollution issues? I don't know that one, Valerie. I, I, I'm not an epiphyte expert. All I know is uh, that the studies have shown that the different kinds of epiphytes can, or, or the composition can vary. Um, and I couldn't honestly even, I probably couldn't even identify most, aside from maybe licorice fern uh, and a couple mosses, I don't think I could identify any epiphytes myself it's a hard thing to do honestly um so i'm sorry i can't answer your question 
Let's see. Alan says maple veneered plywood is beginning to take market share over birch ply as a paint grade cabinet material. Well, that's interesting. That would be great. I would love to see maple become more valuable. Uh, Steve says, how can we develop a market market for maple logs? Um, I don't know. <laughs> that's a hard thing to do. Um, I mean, it starts with a, a, a desirable product, like uh, Alan was saying with the veneered plywood. Um, if you start from that end, you create the demand. And you also ask any tip for IDing figured maple without peeling the bark? No. And as far as I know, that's impossible. Um, the people that I've met that are experienced in this, that go out and looking for the figured maple, you, you do have to cut, not just peel the bark, you actually have to cut a small notch in the tree. And the tree will recover. Um, if the tree's healthy, it will recover. So I, it's not anything to be too concerned about, but uh, it, it does require taking a little chunk of the tree out in order to see that grain. Is there anything that can be done to treat trees in decline? Um, that's a difficult question, uh, only because we're still learning about it. But what I would say, if it's a small handful of trees, maybe in your yard, which where, again, that's where we see a lot of big leaf maple decline, um, it is possible to uh, help them out by watering during the really dry parts of the year and using a, a slow drip irrigation. You don't want to just go and dump a bunch of water on it and just have all that water slick off. Um, you want to do a, a very slow soak uh, on those trees, just, you know, maybe a couple times a month during the really hot parts of the year in August, September, or as it was this year in October when we didn't get any rain. Um, if it's a small handful of trees in a yard, that that could help them. But obviously, that's not feasible at a large scale. Tell us more about canopy needs. How does canopy need an existing older forest? Michael, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Maybe you can elaborate a little more in the chat box. I'll look out for a comment um, uh, lower in the chat box. Marcy asks, I got on so late, you may have already addressed this. How are maple trees doing in the summer droughts? I have some big ones and wonder if I should water them some in late droughty summers. Well, I just answer that. So hopefully, Marcy, you're still on and you caught that. Uh, Michael asked, how big a tree before tapping for sap? You want your tree to be at least 10 inches in diameter at breast height. So that's about four and a half feet off the ground. Um, you want it to be about 10 inches in diameter. And at that point, you can put one tap on the tree. Craig asks, I want more maples for diversity as older ones die off. Is it better to start some new seedlings or to cut some mature trees and let them re- grow? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, your maples can live for a really long time. So it would be a real shame to cut them down early. I would probably recommend, especially if they're old, they may not have the vigor to re-sprout, frankly. Um, so I would probably recommend starting from new seedlings and, um, you know, maybe even starting them in small gaps in other parts of your forest. Um, you know, again, I, I, it's hard to see, to make a suggestion without seeing uh, your forest, but it would be a real shame to go cut a mature maple down because you think it's, unless it's really on death door. Um, but at that point, it probably isn't going to vegetatively sprout. So um, this would be another really great prescription for a service forester to provide and get a better idea of the site and the uh, composition of the forest. Oh, so David made some clarifying comments here. The composition of lichens is the most likely thing to vary in response to air pollution. So post to, to moss or ferns. So thank you, David. That that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Wendy asks, how about a word or two about spalted maple? I'm actually not familiar with spalted maple. Um, so I can, those are the only words I can say about it, unfortunately. <laughs> but I, maybe I'll do a little research on that. Uh, and then, Michael, you made a clarifying comment here. You mentioned you can plant in an existing forest. Just wondering about how to estimate if you have enough light. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, so it sounds, you know, maple doesn't need a tremendous amount of light. It's not like you need to go open up a, um, you know, like a full acre or anything or even even 
a half acre, you could probably open up a, a relatively small size gap, maybe one or two trees worth like of a, of a mature conifer. And that would be enough for a maple to, to open up. We're talking about very small gaps, I think would only all, that's really all that I think would need to be, uh, or would be required to really get maple to recruit into the overstory. Um, because it's just, it is considered moderately shade tolerant. It doesn't need a very large gap. And someone also commented on spalted maple. Spalting is due to a fungus in the trunk. I don't know if this occurs before or after cutting down the tree. Um, oh, I, okay. Now I'm familiar. Yeah. So spalting is a, a desirable trait due to fungus. So yes. I'm, I'm really not familiar with this, but I have heard about that. Um, so I can't, I cannot add to this conversation, unfortunately, but uh, a really good, uh, couple comments here in the chat box about uh spalting being a product of leaving the uh, a cut trunk or a cut a cut log on the uh, ground and allowing the spalting fungus to sort of take over the log so sorry i can't help you there but um it's really sounds really interesting maybe a way to create a, a a better market for maple logs so that's the end of the chat box um and i really appreciate everybody logging in it is 1240. So getting closer each time to getting you guys out on time. Um, I will sit for a little while longer and see if there's any additional questions. Uh, but otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow. Thanks.